I grew up in a, a landlocked part of Connecticut in the northwest corner and never saw the ocean until I was 12, but watched Jacques Cousteau, like many people in my generation, and that really excited me about uh, going underwater and seeing the sea. I really became captivated on a whale watch, uh, or actually it was a Coast Guard cruise in which we saw a lot of whales. and. I just became captivated by the animals. This notion that you could actually study animals that you only see 10% of the time, perhaps less than 5% of their lives, and try to figure out what they're doing. It was just the ultimate in uh, sort of biological challenges. I became involved with right whales because I was concerned about why they weren't reproducing well. For instance, in uh, 1999, there was one right whale calf born to the entire population. So the question to me was, well, why aren't right whales reproducing well? Is it something in the environment that's affecting them? And how do you study a 50-ton whale? So I basically have spent the last 12 years trying to answer that question. It was one of the first aquaria in the world to actually include in its structure and mission uh, research function. But in uh, 1980, we started studying right whales here and quickly developed a catalog of identified individuals. So we track every individual from birth to death and we track them from Florida to Europe. Uh, we work from boats when right whales are in certain habitats that are close to shore, we're able to go out in boats for the day or even overnight and follow the whales during the day and we photograph them and record any behavior. We also study them from the air. Um, for instance, in the calving grounds off the coast of Florida, aerial surveys are run uh, by multiple organizations and these are researchers in small aircraft flying lines back and forth along the coast photographing right whales and reporting their locations so that incoming ships know where to avoid the whales. And a third basic method to study them is by listening for them. In this work, uh, hydrophones, which are underwater microphones, are planted on the bottom of the ocean floor, and these hydrophones pick up characteristic whale noises. Right whales got their name because uh, they were named by whalers four to five hundred years ago because they were the right whales to hunt. And the reason they were the right whales to hunt was that they lived very close to coastal areas, so they were easy to access by boat. Uh, they have very thick blubber layers, so there was a lot of oil that could be extracted by boiling down that blubber. Whalers decimated right whales around the world because they were so valuable, brought populations down to very low levels. This North Atlantic population, there might have been a dozen or two dozen whales by the time the whalers were done. Today, we're still killing right whales, only we're doing it unintentionally through the products of our use of the oceans uh, for fishing, for shipping, um, and uh, whales are a victim of modernization of the ocean and that's why we refer to right whales today as the urban whale. The North Atlantic right whale grows to about uh, 55 feet in length. They're all black. They have no fin on their back. They have graceful wide tails up to 18 feet wide that they lift out of the water at each dive and they have uh, these white or light colored patches of thickened skin on their heads that are uh, called callosities, which form distinctive patterns that we can that allow us to tell individuals apart, just like a human's face allows us to tell individual people apart. At this time, there are an estimated about there's about 475 right whales left in the North Atlantic. Uh, they appear to be growing at very slow rates, uh, one or two percent per year. Their range extends from uh, Florida really to Iceland, although. Most of the well-known habitats are along the east coast of the United States and Canada. We wish that uh, we could import some right whales from the southern hemisphere to build up our northern right whales in the, in the Atlantic Ocean. However, right whales are unable to cross the equator. These southern hemisphere and northern hemisphere populations are completely isolated by the warm temperatures of the equator. Right whales have thick blubber and they have a problem with overheating. They're unable to cross through warm tropical waters. 
So basically the northern hemisphere right whales are on their own to recover. Right whales are called mysticetes and they feed by straining their food from the water. And what they use to strain their food are plates of baleen. This is one plate of baleen and you can see the inside, and this would be near the whale's tongue, has this very fine fringe. And this is used to actually filter out very small little plankton, pieces of plankton, copepods from the water. So right whales in the spring months uh, feed on the surface of the water. They actually open their mouths and you can see the baleen plates and they push along the surface and skim the plankton off the surface of the water. When right whales are up north in the Bay of Fundy in August and September, these copepods are way down in the water column. In fact, they're right above the bottom at about 300 feet. So right whales dive. They go to the bottom, open their mouths, they're feeding right above the bottom, and in fact sometimes they come up with mud on their heads, they are so, so close to the bottom. They skim the copepods and they come back up and they dive for 11 or 12 minutes at a time. Surface active groups are a characteristic of right whale behavior that are really amazing, which is uh, the, first, the first encounters with them, we mostly encountered single females with multiple males engaged in what looked like courtship activity. Um, and sometimes there would be a single female and as many as 25 or 35 animals, all of which, the, almost all of the rest were males. And uh, it looks like the female continues to call in males over long periods of time to keep the competition fierce around her. And males are always kind of pushing each other around and displacing one another, trying to get close to the female. And these can last for hours. In fact, I think we've seen them last over six hours at a time. And when the female's done, she just dives and stops calling, and that's the end of it. There is a characteristic behavior, we call it gunshotting. And it usually involves two, a pair of males, so two adult males, swimming in kind of a ritualized fashion, lifting their heads periodically, and then as they drop their head in the water, so the head comes up, and as they push it down in the water, there's this very loud, sounds like a gunshot underwater. We don't know how they make it. We don't know what it means. When we see gunshotting males, they usually off a little bit from the rest of the group of whales that are feeding. Um, so we don't really know much about that, but it's kind of interesting that these animals have a lot of mysteries that they're still holding back on us. They encounter lots of large ships and they encounter lots of fishing gear along the east coast of North America. We used to lose a couple of whales a year, a couple of right whales a year to collisions with ships. They apparently don't hear them and don't get out of the way or don't recognize them as a threat and actually can get killed by collisions. In addition to being killed directly by collisions with vessels and by getting entangled in fishing gear and drowning, uh, the other major threat is less defined, and that is a decreased rate of reproduction. Um, in some years, right whales have had as few as one calf or a couple of calves, and in other years they've had 30 calves or more. For a population of about 500 whales, we would expect around 40 calves per year. So overall, their reproductive rate has been low, much lower than right whales in the southern hemisphere, and in some years it's plummeted. Uh, in fact, just last year we have only had seven calves born to the entire population. So something clearly is affecting reproduction in right whales and uh, we don't know what that is, but there are many possible factors in the ocean. That's a big mystery that we are still trying to sort through. Right whales live in a coastal zone off the east coast of North America that is full of fishing gear. And most of the fishing gear that they encounter is fixed in the water column. So, for example, a, uh, if this were a lobster trap, um, if my foot were a lobster trap, there needs to be a buoy on the top that marks where that trap is. And sometimes multiple traps are strung out along the ocean floor, all tied to a single buoy line. Now, whales traveling along the surface or at depth are coming along and they may not see that line, and then they hit the rope, let's say in this case, right by the flipper, and then as they turn away and try to run away, the rope actually wraps over the body and can come up under the tail. And now you've got a whale that's partly wrapped in fishing gear, and then it wraps over the back, and then the whale tries to thrash around and get out and gets wrapped up. And 
This is the way in which uh, right whales get entangled and show scars, especially around the tailstock, where we see a lot of right whale entanglement scars. The solution to the entanglement problem ultimately is probably to remove as much rope from the water as possible uh, so that whales don't have the chances to encounter it. But other solutions may exist, including uh, changing the colors of rope uh, so that they're more highly visible, or changing rope so that it's not quite as strong and breaks when whales encounter it. All of these things are being considered and the fishermen are actively engaged in uh, a lot of research to try to solve this problem. We actually need more than anything else. We need a comprehensive ocean plan that takes into account cumulative impacts of everybody's desire to go be industrial in the oceans and what it means to the animals that live there. And we need ways to be smarter about mitigating those impacts and about um, intelligent development. We need to be better about working in the ocean with the needs of the animals that live there already. Well, the fact that right whales are here at all on this planet gives us cause for hope. These are very long-lived animals. They may live to be 75 to 100 years or more, and they're very resilient. We almost killed them off in the last century with whaling, and now we're unintentionally killing them as a byproduct of our civilization. Um, but the strides and successes that we've had over the last several decades have really been effective and right whales are, the population is growing. Fewer right whales, we believe, are getting killed by ships. There's a lot of cause for hope. We do have a lot of new challenges with oil and gas exploration, wind development off our shores and so forth. So there's much more work to be done and um, we need new ideas and new solutions. But overall, we remain optimistic about the future of right whales for generations to come. Thank you.